Hi, it's Laurel Smith, and I'm going to read to you chapter three and four from the book, The Quest for Quinny. If you'd like to stop, push pause, and go to www.laurelasmith.com to my remote reading page, you can follow along with me if you'd like to. So it's www.laurelasmith.com. I'll wait for a sec. Or you can just listen, lay down and listen, put yourself to sleep with it, whatever you want to do. The Quest for Quinny, Chapter 3. That picture looks like marshmallows to me. Toasted marshmallows, how yummy are those? After two weeks of lousy weather, we were finally able to return to our river for our annual overnight camping trip. Grandpa's retired, so he could go anytime. He checked the almanac, the local newspaper, and the television weather report. It was Tuesday. We couldn't wait. The almanac, that's a book that's from New Hampshire. That's an important thing. Talk with your family about that sometime, about the almanac. Our plan was to take Grandpa's pontoon boat out on the river. It floats around like a room on water. It's a boat that's held up by large hollow cylinders. Grandpa and I each owned pop-up tents. So did Sean. But his was an easy one. He got his as a present. It came from one of those real expensive sports catalogs. He could toss it into the air and it always landed for sleeping. Sean had some neat and interesting things in his house. His mom even moved out the dining room set and put in a table soccer game. We played that often when it was raining. Some people call that foosball too. It's a really fun game to play. Grandpa went into town and got some of his supplies. He liked to buy sodas for us. The old fashioned soda always stirred memories of his childhood, even though I never saw a spoon anywhere. When he had had this brand, he'd start sharing stories. Grandpa also bought fish-shaped crackers. It made him laugh because we went fishing with fish food. He was always ready to enjoy a good joke. We planned on cooking hamburgers over an open fire for dinner. Grammy said, here, take these veggies and a couple of apples. I worry about your health. Luckily, she also tossed in a dozen of her world-famous peanut butter cookies. I love my Grammy. Grandpa, Sean, and I looked, loaded up the pontoon before dark. Then we launched the pontoon into the river toward our favorite island. We found our usual campout spot in good shape. Well, I'm surprised, said Grandpa. With that February blizzard we had, I thought the island would be in rough shape. We had decided to have a late meal at the campsite. The morning before, Grammy and I had gathered some dandelions for cook, to cook for supper. They kind of taste like spinach. We had dug around the outside of each plant's root and down a little deeper into the dirt. I cringed at the sound of the metal blade scraping into the gravel. But if you didn't hear that sound, you were too close to the plant. If it isn't pulled out correctly, it will fall apart. The white milky liquid from the stem always sticks to my fingers like pine pitch. The greens then were rinsed, soaked in salted water, and rinsed again. I filled our kettle with water and piled the rinsed greens inside, ready to cook. Grandpa and Sean worked on building the fire. The dandelions were unusually bitter that night. Grandpa garnished them with lots of cider vinegar, salt, and a big pat of butter. He twirled a load of them on his fork. He opened his mouth wide, bit, closed his eyes, and commented, Now that's a little bit of heaven. I said, I hope heaven has more to offer than lawn weeds. I'd rather have a nice piece of chocolate. It was time for dessert s'mores. Linda and Sean had packed the supplies for the s'mores. Marshmallows, 
graham crackers, and a gigantic chocolate bar. When the campfire had burnt low and all that was left was ash-covered red-hot coals, we began to get our cooking sticks ready. At the edge of the woods, Sean and I picked out long, thin green branches, about as thick as a finger. With our jackknives, we each cut one off its tree where it joined a bigger branch, trying not to do much damage. We peeled back the outer coating like Grandpa had taught us, being careful to scrape the bark off away from each other or ourselves in case our jackknife slipped. The stick smelled like fresh picked flowers. Putting our jackknives away, we pushed a couple of soft marshmallows on the skinny pointy ends. We held them just above the coals and let the heat rise to slowly brown the edges of the tree. Perfect, exclaimed Grandpa. Then we gently slid the sticky, melting goo off onto the top of a square of chocolate, which was resting on a graham cracker. Another cracker went on top of the marshmallow. We pressed it down to make a sweet sandwich. Easy, not so hard to break it. Let's do it all over again, I said. Just so tasty. That's why they're called s'mores, because you always want some more. S'more, some more. Don't you know? Yeah, I do. The three of us told ghost stories into the nighttime hours. You've told ghost stories probably or scary stories with your friends to make them like be a little jumpy. So let's see what they told. I shared the one about the one arm hook handed hitchhiker who lived on the river. He only came out at night and to steal travelers' belongings. Hopefully that was all he did. Da da dum. Sean told the one of the Bigfoot creature that gathered up innocent children and took them home for dinner. His dinner. Dum, dum, dum. Grandpa talked about the band of river hobos and gypsies that travel up and down the train tracks along the river. The group has traveled this route for over a century. More than a hundred years. They must be ghosts by now. Dum, dum, dum. That's a scary one. Woo, woo. I heard an owl. Snap. A twig broke. We all held our breaths. What could it be? Even Grandpa was spooked. But we all pretended not to be scared. We're not scared. Snap. Woohoo. <laughs> they were scared. Lights out, Grandpa announced. We have fish to catch early in the a.m. We sure did. Look out, little fishies. Sean and I had gotten some awesome fishing lures at the downtown hardware store that week. They were guaranteed to catch the big ones. We wanted rainbow trout, but all we usually got was perch and bass. Perch is bony and prickly. Bass can be wormy. We wanted trout. Good night, everyone. Maddie, Sean, and anyone else, Grandpa jested. Good night, Grandpa Robinson. You too, Maddie, Sean answered back. See you at sunrise, I told them both as I drifted off to sleep. We woke to an excellent day for fishing and an even better day for daydreaming. We did manage to catch a couple of trout. They were brown trout, though, not rainbow. But that was a good haul on the river. Also, my biggest fish was two inches longer than Sean's or Grandpa's. We put all the fish on a stringer and they trailed behind the boat. We had only one major incident. A napkin fell over the side of the boat. Luckily, the fish and game weren't out looking for people littering. Grandpa mentioned it would have been a $500 fine. I thought he was just teasing. As we docked the boat on shore and headed for home, we noticed we had lost more than our napkin. Our day's catch had disappeared off the back of the boat. That's odd, Grandpa muttered as he pulled back his cap and scratched his head. He hopped off the boat and started to search around the shoreline for the missing fish. 
Sean elbowed me and whispered, maybe your imaginary sea creature swallowed them all. Sean, I said with a scowl. Well, I've never seen it. Where is it? He asked. I yelled, I don't know, but it's real. He said, yeah, as real as eel weeds. I agreed. Eel weeds are real. So what's your point? Okay, river weeds are real, but your imaginary elephant isn't. Is so, is not. I really wanted to push him in. I was so angry. I felt my face getting hot and red. It wasn't from sunburn either. I was mad. Sean, you should believe me. Believe in an imaginary river elephants, he said, making a face. That's it. I'd had it. Jerk. Grandpa returned empty-handed and asked, what's going on now? Sean said, oh, she thinks there's more in this river than just fish. You never know, Grandpa added. All the way home, I ignored Sean. I only talked to Grandpa. Whenever Sean looked my direction, I would press my lips together and turn my head away. Ever been that mad at somebody? And then you want them to believe it and you're saying, oh, it's the truth. It really, really is. And for Maddie, it's really the truth. But Sean, why would Sean believe it? He's not seen it and he lives by the river. She doesn't. Oh, that's sad. Finally, we arrived in Grandpa's backyard. The usual short hike from the river seemed to take forever. Thanks, Grandpa Robertson, Sean said as he headed for his house. I wished he wasn't calling my grandpa his. You're welcome, Sean. Real sorry about losing that catch of trout, Grandpa replied. That stuff happens. Bye, Maddie. Sean, I acknowledged him out of the politeness for my grandfather's sake. It was going to be a long summer. It's the end of chapter three. Chapter four, Tears of Blame. Hmm, it sounds like that one might be a little bit sad. It starts with tears. Blaming's usually telling somebody they did something wrong. And here's a picture. It is a deep, and a thing that says vacancy. It kind of looks like a, like a motel or, yeah, let's read about that. That night, all I thought about was how the camping trip ended with Sean and me. It bothered me very much that we had fought. It wasn't often Sean and I were both really mad at each other. It was hard enough for me right now because that morning, Daddy came to stay for the weekend, which just reminded me that things were not okay with Mom and Daddy. My dad's family came from Connecticut. Our home was just outside of Hartford. Well, his still was. I wanted him to visit. I missed him so. I wish mom and dad missed each other as much. He and mom first met at Keene State College and both planned on becoming teachers. If you're from around here, a lot of your teachers went to Keene State College. It's right in New Hampshire. You could ask them, did you go to college at Keene State? And they'll be like, how did you know that? Why are you asking? So it was a real popular college around here to come and teach. He told me years ago it was called Key Normal School. Dad said it couldn't be called that anymore. He said no one in our family was normal. He meant that in a joking way. They really did love each other once. He told me they were married young and some people grow up together, but sadly they grew up in a park. The saddest is me. Whenever Dad visited me at Woodland that summer, he stayed at the Pine Knoll Motel. He said, it's just up the road, beast. Grammy and Grandpa said he was always welcome to stay with them. But Dad told me it was uncomfortable 
for him because they were mom's family. I said it was my family too, and so was he. We did make the best of our time together wherever he stayed. The motel had an outdoor heated pool. By mid-morning, we went swimming. I loved to jump cannonballs. I always tried to drench daddy with a big splash. When I got him with a good wave, he would bellow, you little scallywag, and dive in to chase me at the edge of the pool. I love cannonballs. I don't dive, but cannonball, they're so fun to do, but make sure it's safe and there's enough water and it doesn't say no jumping or diving off the side. It's going to be really deep. Dad, I'm going to win this time, I squealed, but he was too fast a swimmer. Even after he stubbed his toe onto the bottom of the pool, I've done that too. It has a gritty bottom to keep people from slipping. I said to Daddy, I think they should paint slippery when wet on the bottom instead. He chuckled, Maddie, you always make me laugh. He continued to joke with me with the back of his hand across his forehead and pretending to look weak. Would you please go to the office and get me a bandage? They sound like they have a lot of fun. Oh, Daddy, you always crack me up too. Go, nurse, darling. I need first aid immediately. And he whirred the sound of an ambulance. I love my daddy and miss seeing him every day. He was an airplane pilot, and especially like the international flights. I loved them too, because he brought back such great exotic souvenirs. His next flight was to Hong Kong. That's pretty far. I went to get the bandage from the Ona, Rhoda. Rhoda isn't always friendly, and she definitely isn't a morning person. She smelled like stale cigarettes and bathed herself in perfume to cover up. Every time it clogged my nose up and would steal my breath for a minute, I knocked and asked for the bandage. Without a word, she left the screen door. I heard a rattling and a dog yelp. It must be Buster, her poodle. That poor dog turned out to be a boy poodle, and Rhonda didn't care. She put bows on top of his head and gave him all sorts of hairdos. Too weird. Rhonda startled me. Here, kid, take a handful, and next time you'll have them. You won't have to bother me at the crack of dawn. I smiled and said, thanks, Rhoda started to walk away. Rhoda yelled out, hey, and if your dad needs attention, you can send him my way. I nodded, but turned away and felt my nose scrunch up, like when you spelled smell sour milk. Like My dad doesn't need any other woman's help but mine now, and certainly not Rhoda's. Dad said, thanks, Florence Nightingale. Let's grab a burger at the coffee shop and go bowling. Going bowling that afternoon was nice because it was air conditioned in the alley. There were only two air conditioned places around town. The other one was the movie theater. Dad and I planned to go there the next afternoon if we hadn't already seen the two movies they were playing. I didn't always like living near the city, but there were more choices than near my grandparents. Daddy and I love to bowl. We never scored much over 95, and I barely hit the 70s, but we laughed a lot and picked on each other. He said, I always have trouble with these little candle pins. Give me 10 pin any time. I said, Daddy, you have 10 pins, and you're still not doing very good. The alley was crowded. The people in the leagues came in. I ran into Mrs. Miller, my grandparents' busy body neighbor. She was nosy. How are you doing, dear? She asked and looked over toward my dad, who was turning in our bowling shoes. She looked back at me with droopy, sad eyes. Tell me, dear, is your father staying with you or at that rude Rhoda's place? He's at the Pine Knoll. I answered shortly. She's always nosy. Wouldn't you think she'd worry about herself more than my family 
Even her own kids don't visit her to be asked all those dumb questions. Wonder why. Well, hello, Mrs. Miller. How is your daughty Sadie doing? My daddy asked her loudly. She's just fine. Thank you, Mrs. Miller answered abruptly and walked away. I just smiled at daddy. He poked my dimple and said, what you smirking about, doll face? Nothing, daddy. Dimples. It's these things. Yep. What? Isn't that funny? They they hurt, though, if you laugh a lot. They kind of get sore. But, yeah, that's a dimple. We understood each other really well, even if we were not together all the time. Dad and I pulled into Grandpa's driveway. Mom's station wagon was already there. My stomach felt jumpy. Dad and I got out slowly. Mom and Dad were going to have that talk today about the arrangements. I thought I wanted to say to see what would happen to me, to them, but I changed my mind. I asked if I could go for a walk with Rascal. I headed for Sean's, having forgotten I was mad at him. But then I remembered I called him a jerk. And he pretty much had called me a liar. So I walked down to the river alone and sat on the dock. What is going on? Mom and Dad are really getting divorced. I was really moving. Sean and I weren't talking. My eyes welled with tears. They streamed down my face like warm spring rain. One of my tears hit the river water. I looked in astonishment as the water seemed to flow up and transform into the shape of a creature. Perplexed, I look into the face of the gentle giant. As our eyes met, hers seemed to mirror my own. I should have been afraid, but it wasn't. Who are you? I asked inquisitively. Rising out of the water, the being blinked enormous eyelashes and very calmly answered, I'm called Quinny. I thought, was this real? She had to be real, or whom else was I talking to? What are you called, she asked me. Do, do you mean my name? I finally cleared my throat and got out the words. <clears throat> It's Maddie. Where did you come from? I needed to make sense of this. The water, she replied. Of course she came from the water. Are there more of you? I asked next. I have a family, but we're not all together right now. How odd was that? This creature and I had the separation of our families in common. My parents are apart. I know how you feel, I said. After a moment, I commented, You are so large. You are so small, she noticed. True. My mind was in a little bit of a daze. This was really happening. I had so many questions. Where is your family? I addressed her. It was, oh, so long ago. I was young. I remember being together and feeling warm inside. There were many of us, and we were all happy. And he got quiet and continued. Then it came. It was terrible. The sky opened up. It was loud. Things were flying around us, and flames of the fire were falling everywhere. The rocks were breaking, and the trees were cracking. We tried swimming away. I felt so scared and unsafe. I'm sorry, Quinny. My heart hurt for her. I felt a big pain in my head. I saw black dots and felt cold. When I woke up, my family was gone. I was alone. I don't know why. Have you tried looking for them, I wondered? I've searched everywhere of this river. I've been everywhere. Maybe I can help you, I offered. I hope so. I would like that. We both paused for a while. 
I think we were both thinking about our situations, that our families weren't whole. I am sorry you were sad about your family, Maddie, Winnie said. We are never all together anymore. I'm always apart from one of them, I added. You may be away from each of them now, but at least you know where they are. Maybe I'm lucky, I said aloud and then thought I might have hurt her feelings. Maddie, you are. You have two people who live in different places who love you. She seemed glad for me. I have three places. My grandparents' home is always filled with love. It was actually amazing. I came to the river feeling so lonely and scared, and then I was actually feeling good, except I needed to help Quinny find her family. How? I was just a kid. Behind me, I heard, Maddie. It was Sean speaking. I looked in his direction, but quickly turned back because I was afraid Quinny would have disappeared. I was pleasantly surprised to see her still in our presence. I spun my head around to look at Sean again. For a change, he was speechless. His mouth hung open and his eyes were big. Like that, I bet. Because here she was telling him it's real, and now he's seeing it. So, <laughs> Quinny and Sean watched each other. Neither of them blinked for a very long time. Then Sean looked at me. Well, I said, now that he had seen Quinny. Well, what? He asked back. I pointed to Quinny. Sean stated, seeing is believing. There was silence. Is that all you have to say? About what, I asked. He asked. About Quinny. She's right here. I see that, Maddie. I believe you. You didn't before, I said hurtfully. I'm sorry. That's all he said. But that was enough. Sean never said anything he didn't mean. I wanted more of an apology, but that's what I got. Take it or leave it. It didn't wash away the pain he caused, but it was a start. Quinny spoke. He's here with a pure heart. What do you mean, Quinny? I asked. He has forgiveness in his soul, she added. I feel his sorrow. Maddie, I am really sorry, he walked closer to me. He looked remorseful. I smirked and said, I accept. And we did the secret handshake. Quinny said, by what name are you called? Sean answered without hesitation, as if he often met river creatures. Sean, and I assume you are Quinny. Your hair is the color of sunlight, she observed. My hair is blonde, if that's what you mean. Of all things to talk about, she commented on his hair. I wondered why Quinny noticed that. She seemed to stare at him for quite a while. What was she thinking? We waited patiently. And that's the end. End of chapter four. Chapter five is called, Do You See What I See? So we'll be reading that later. So thanks for stopping, and I'll see you another time. And we'll keep reading The Quest for Quinny. Bye.